And now this for Grandmaster J of the NFAC from former African slave, Bull Guy Ding from South Sudan. I want to ask you a question. Since slavery is still going on now in Africa, in the Sudan, where there are tens of thousands of Africans that are today, 2020, in slavery, what do you have to say to Grandmaster J? John Fitzgerald Johnson. Grandmaster J has said uh, that, uh, you know, he's, they're, they're tired, they're sick and tired of, of oppression. What, what invitations can you offer Grandmaster J about going to Sudan and going to Africa to free the black people in slavery today? You know, I would ask him if he's very concerned about the slavery, I think he should contact me and my team so we can go to South Sudan or maybe go to Sudan and help those who slave. So, and also we can go to Libya. That's where this problem is. And also they can also learn about the, the history of the slavery in, 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 uh, with facts, not just with the uh, assumption. Because a lot of the people here in the diaspora, and we call it diaspora actually, uh, people that live in America or maybe in Europe, a lot of these people, they took information based on what they read and what they get online, and what get, but it's not the real facts because they never speak to African have been enslaved. Uh, it's uh, slavery uh, captivity, maybe an auction. People like me who actually lived it. People like me are witness beating and, and put the shame in the hand. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about my grandfather. And when I say us, I'm talking about you too. No matter where you are in the world, I'm talking to you too. The time for us to stop treating each other like we're different. The time for us to stop hating someone just because they fly under a different flag. When we all fly under the melanin flag, when we're all part of diaspora. Most people don't know that the word diaspora is Greek. It literally means the scattered flag. When we're all part of diaspora. When we're all part of diaspora. Core radio, baby. Quorum Radio, WRMI, on with Bolgai Deng, who is currently campaigning for the president of South Sudan and lives currently in the United States. He's lived here since 1999, and for him, life in the United States is a huge change. Because as just a young boy, Bolgai Deng, his small Ewild village was attacked early one morning by thousands of Mujahideen on horseback, armed with AK-47s and with machetes. They killed the older males and many of the women. The rest, along with the children, were beaten rounded up, and forced to march on foot to Dihan, Sudan, near Darfur. A few weeks later, seven-year-old Bulgai Deng was sold to Ali Abdullah, a wealthy landowner there. At first rebelling, Bull was regularly beaten and locked up in chains at night before he settled down in one Abdullah's trust to go out in the fields alone. And then he slept, however, in the rain with the cows that he tended, and he ate from garbage cans. While tending the cows in the fields, Bull was able to jump aboard a train bound for Khartoum and made his escape. With the help of two fellow Dinkas, Bull found a refugee camp and was allowed to attend school, but was forced to speak only Arabic and learn the Islamic faith. In 1998, Bull was smuggled from Khartoum to Egypt via their Underground Railroad. He was a teenager and found there was no hope in Egypt and no respect for Africans either. He and others survived with the protection of their tight-knit Sudanese community. Bull learns the UN was offering asylum for perceived Sudanese, and a friend wrote up Bull's story in English and sent it to the UN Cairo office. Bull Guy was one of many granted an interview, but it was only he who was one of 10, allowed to go forward. He came to the United States and eventually learned English and began to even teach as an associate professor of Homeland Security at Virginia Commonwealth University. Bull Guy currently is an activist for his nation of South Sudan and has led protests in front of the White House to reimpose sanctions on Sudan, a country that is actively trying to obtain South Sudanese land, a majority Christian country. Bulgai knows that Islam equals slavery, and 
infiltration until an entire nation is in chains. Bulgai is a published author also who has written uh, these following books, Legacy of African Freedom Fighter, Children's Books by Jay Tinsley, Cobb, Freedom, A Lost Boy, His Cows, Their Journey, Arab, Racism and Kush, and Bulgai Deng's website for all of you to take down and notice is Kush Democratic Majority Dot org. That's www.kushdemocraticmajority.org. Bulgai Deng, welcome to Quorum Radio. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. That's fantastic. Well, listen, you've got an incredible story. Sadly, there are so many other people who don't have a voice. They're currently slaves in Africa, slaves because of Islam. And they're living in precarious situations, just like you did when you were just a young boy. What's the message that you want to tell Americans right now, gripped by the Black Lives Matter movement, gripped by, you know, demands for reparations? What's your, what's your reaction to all this? Uh, thank you, Bill, for giving me a chance to speak. And, uh, and uh, actually, have you, you learned from my bio uh, that the struggle that I went through and I made it to the United States, and uh, my message to the Black Lives Matter and the rest of the U.S. American citizen is that uh, uh, slavery still exists. Uh, slavery still exists in Sudan. Slavery still exists in Mauritania. And slavery still exists in Libya right now. So in Africa, we still have a slavery. And no one is Maybe. trying to address this issue except someone like me who was given a chance to come to the United States. Now I have a voice to speak up and share my story with you and the rest of your audience. And the majority right. of slavery slave right now, they're still in the market and action and they have no voice. So I'm here to speak on behalf of those who are still in captivity right now in Sudan and all over Africa, it's particularly North Africa. And these are the yes. issues that I believe that America should pay attention and to look at this slavery still exists in Africa right now. And uh, uh, that is my message. Uh, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, I think also they should focus on this issue. That yes, we have a concern in America, but we can address this concern in, 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 a, in, a, in a legal way. Uh, racism, we can address this. And we have a system here in America that can address this issue in a legal yes. matter, and it could uh, be fast and address this matter, whether for this brutality or other concern, uh, the way we live in the U.S. Uh, but the big issue is now that a slavery that's been going on for 400 years ago still exists in Africa, and no one is willing to speak about this. The African leaders ahead of the state, they failed to address this issue. Uh, the African activists, they have, they refuse not to address this issue. Uh, the churches, uh, they refuse to address this issue, and this issue is still going on, and this is not just a kidnapping issue. This is a slavery that is still exists. When the attackers have been organized by the, Islam, by the name of Islamic faith to come and attack Africans, uh, to wipe them out and take their land away from them, and take that woman to be used as sexual uh, manner. And these are the issues that have been going on, uh, son, and they say they never stop. And when I was kidnapped, I was with more than 700 kids and, and women and children and girls. And I was a little bit young. I did not realize maybe there could be more. And the attackers have been doing this beyond uh, 1987. They've been doing this in 19, uh, uh, 1998. In 1993, and it go on until 2000. Uh, so you could imagine how many uh, kids have been enslaved in Sudan, and they've been smuggled from the south to the western Darfur, all the way to Libya, and this has been going on uh, from the desert uh, very much uh, to Libya to Mediterranean Sea. So this has been going on for a long time. The question I want to ask you is, so you want to become president of South Sudan. Tell me what you want to do for your country. Tell me what you want to do to be able to, to, to make it into a, a, a stable African state. What I want to do, I want to stop the war that's going on in the country. The war that was designed and organized by the government. The government is the one that actually designed the war by using the ethnic tribal line to divide the community 
and to divide them and to rule them. So the, the, the system that actually it was well organized after we got independent from the North, the, the same system that we left in the North is still the same system we have in South Sudan. Because most of these uh, revolutionaries who were fighting at the time, a lot of them adopt the Islamic culture and the Arab culture and used to kill their own African citizen or to oppress their own citizen. So we believe that we have to stop the war uh, to bring the peace uh, to the country. And, and instead for us to do that, we actually demand the people of South Sudan, they have to have a voice because that the one can choose the leader, can elect the leader. In order for us to do that, we need to call election for the South Sudanese to elect our own leader, because democracy is something that we fought for in, in, in 1983, because most of South Sudanese, they fought so they can be free from the Arabism and Islamism, so they can have their own Christian nation where people can be allowed to vote freely. That was the intention of the war. So now they have their own land. It's a time for them to be given a chance to choose their leader. And that is the issue that we are focused on. We believe also South Sudan could be a basket of Africa where actually development, it could be the main factor. And uh, we'll be able to build and put education in place, education system, and also uh, the uh, facilities of Medicare and other things that the African women and children need. That the thing that we are focused on it in my campaign. These are the things that we mentioned that we can do for them. Now the government that we have, they have failed the people of South Sudan, uh, the corruption that uh, very much is uh, become uh, a way of life in South Sudan by the Africa, by the South Sudanese elite is something we have to stop the corruption because the corruption is the one destroy the country. Uh, these are our focus. We have a lot in our fleet that we have to pursue to bring a peaceful nation uh, of South Sudan. Are there also, I want to ask you a question, uh, Gulbai, is, are there any um, products made by South Sudanese that people can buy on Amazon or that they can buy from a foundation that um, can help, uh, help raise funds? Is there anything that you know about? Like, no, um, actually... And this is one of one of the reasons we believe that South Sudan as a sovereign nation is supposed to have their own products. And the government fell after we got independent, most of the money that was given by the international community and particularly the United States. The United States donated about forty billion, I'm talking about B, fourteen or, or, or excuse me, fourteen billion it was given by the United States for the development in South Sudan. Those money went to the pockets for the, Africa, the South Sudan corrupt leaders. They divide the money. They're supposed to use those money so the South Sudan can produce their own product as a new nation. They failed to do that, and they stole the money, and then they fight over those money. Mostly 75 South Sudan officials, South Sudan leaders, they divide the money and they build houses in Uganda and Kenya. A lot of them even uh, bought houses right here in America. A lot of them went to Australia and UK and bought houses there. So the money had been divided by the leaders, and then they start the war among themselves. So we are looking forward in our team, in our uh, my, my candidacy, to make sure that South Sudan be able to produce and have a factory where they can employ their own citizens, be able to have their own uh product made in South Sudan. Now what we have in South Sudan they, is the women using their own culture skill to, to, to design things in their own way uh, to put them in the market, which actually something has been used in the hand. It doesn't get ahead to be very much exported outside. So the issue that we are facing in South Sudan is that South Sudan have no manufacturing manufacturer, have no factory in the country right now that it can employ their own citizen. The only what South Sudan rely on is the oil. And the oil actually was very much the money of the oil. It was controlled by the leaders. So mostly money, the oil money go to the, to the leadership. And the leadership actually use those money for their own benefit, not the citizen benefit. So we believe that in my leadership now, we are going to focus to have something that have to be made in South Sudan where actually South Sudan will be able to have a product they can be able to ship outside uh, of the country. Right. And so right now, 
you know, your country is um, it's, it's fairly large. How many square miles is it? Gold by. It's very large. South Sudan can combine Uganda and part of Kenya because the lot is a big country. Uh, before South Sudan uh, gained independence, actually, South Sudan is the uh, the largest country in Africa. The biggest country in Africa is the Sudan. And where South Sudan broke away is still like compared to the East African nation. Let's say uh, Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda. South Sudan is still the biggest country when it comes to East Africa region. Uh, and that is what is going on. And South Sudan have a big land, and South Sudan do not have uh, people because the people have been killed by the war, the war that was going on with Islamists that were pursuing the Sudan to be Islamic and Arabic states. That actually killed more than 2.5 uh, 2 million from 1983 all the way to 2005. Before that also, there was a war that went on, killed one million and a half uh, in 1960 all the way to 1972. Uh, but uh, not only the war have killed the South Sudanese, the slavery also uh, very much uh, reduce the citizens of South Sudan because most of South Sudan have been kidnapped by the Islamic uh, militants uh, to the slavery. And those slave uh, African have will not count on the population of South Sudanese. And that been going on from 18, 1700 all the way to 1800 and been even beyond uh, 700. So if you calculate that you talk about millions that have been taken to Arabia, and a lot of them end up dying. They did not re reach Europe because they have been used as a pre uh, domestic label. A lot of them die in the Middle East. They didn't make it to the Europe. Uh, but uh, let's say the population of South Sudan have been killed by the Islamic uh, militants and the Arabs uh, fundamentalists to this day. We're still fighting that. We ne it never stops. And it will not stop. So, so let me ask you a question. I have a question. So how many, how many people currently live in South Sudan? Uh, but we're, uh, based on, uh, on uh, census of 2000, uh, 2011, it, it would say about uh, 14 million. Uh, 14 million during, people. Yeah 14, yeah, 14 million people. But during the time of war, now a lot of them went to Sure. A lot of them went to uh, very much to uh, East African region, and uh, and a lot of them right now the refugees came about two point four million are living in refugees came, and and that in Uganda and Kenya, uh, so you would say that roughly if that a lot of people now are living in refugees came, it means that what we have now is about maybe ten or uh, eleven million that live in the country. Right. And how, okay. Well, let me ask you this about about your your country. It's in terms of agriculture. Uh, how important is the agricultural sector of South Sudan? Is it a fertile country? Is it a country with, with very productive farmland? Yes. Yes. South Sudan is, a, is, is, is very productive agricultural land. And that was South Sudan is good at it. And it's, it's plot land. I have no mountain uh, very much. Is a plot. So this land is the very much is agricultural land, and that how South Sudan has been living for centuries and millennium through agriculture. They did not have uh, a factory manufacturers, and even when the Sudan was actually the country had been controlled by the by the government of Center of Khartoum, they never had a chance to control the South Sudan. The South Sudan is the war independent in their own way. They feed themselves through the agriculture. Agriculture is the main factor in South Sudan. If South Sudan has to get ahead to become a nation, that wealthy nation, they need to rely on agriculture. And that, that actually very much is the main uh, income and the main, uh, could be the main factor of the, of the country to move forward. And uh, because of the land of South Sudan produce sort of an, uh, very much uh, thing they have to relate to agriculture uh, uh, could be produced in South Sudan. And that's why it's so important uh, for nation to go back, not to focus on oil, not to focus on gold and uranium and other things, uh, the animal resources. Also, is another uh, income in South Sudan because South Sudan have the largest animal in Africa. 
uh, whether you, you talk about elephant, you talk about the deer, you talk about the lion, you talk about other things. So these are uh, existing sources. And so these are uh, animal resources and also the agriculture are the main factor that South Sudan can move ahead without focus on yeah, oil could be another factor as well, but oil should not be the main focus. Now, the government of South Sudan used the oil as the main focus uh, which can bring the income to the nation. Now let the move you to without jobs, you cannot create the jobs that the South Sudanese can rely on. Uh, they say South Sudan do not have been uh, a way to form agriculture in 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 a nation where let's say park, uh, let, let's say tractors and other things were not brought by the government. Uh, now the South Sudan is still using the traditional uh, way of farming by using their own hand. Uh, to form their own agriculture, their own food, so they can be able to produce to, for their families. So the majority of South Sudan are still using their hand right now than using tractors uh, as a nation that's supposed to rise. They're supposed to work with other uh, nations and bring tra uh, tractors that they can be able to use to benefit, to have the, the, the citizen, but they never done that. A lot of the yeah. tractors that few of them was brought uh, was used by the elites. Uh, the, the leaders are the one benefiting, using them for their own uh, benefit. So it was not the citizen that benefit from it. So that the nation, very much the leaders do not care about their own citizens. That's what's going on in South Sudan. Uh, well, okay. So uh, listen, thanks a lot, Goldbye Deng, for being on Quorum Radio, WRMI. Your website again, I guess, is Kush Democratic Majority .org. Kush is spelled K U S H, Kush Democratic Majority .org. But yes, and I, you know, at, yeah. Well, I was going to say, uh, old guy, that um, if we go back centuries, if we go back before the American Revolutionary War, if we go back to, you know, the the seventeenth century, the sixteenth century, the fifteenth, fourteenth century, um, there was a tremendous amount of slavery uh, involving white European victims. And they were seized in their countries by Muslim slave raiders from North Africa. Uh, and they sought, and they were successful in many cases, to take away, they took away thousands of Europeans into bondage in Africa. Well, tell me, why is it that Islam does this? You know, that is a good uh, question you asked me. Uh, that have been the the tactics of the uh, founding father of Islam, which a lot of people call him Muhammad. Yeah. He was the founding father of Islam. He was a warrior. He actually uh, defined Islam based on fight. Uh, you have to win by kidnapping, slaving. That is the faith that most of the Muslim uh, believers share, uh, and, 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 and that uh, it was written also in, in, the, in their books. There's nothing that is not lie about it. If you speak Arabic like me, I will tell you the truth. These have been written in, the, in their own Quran, and they've been practicing this as a way of life. Uh, most of this labor has been going on in Africa before, even European arrived to Africa in the uh, nine, uh, ninth century. It was very much uh, the Muslim faith in practice uh, slavery in Africa. Even when the European arrived uh, during the Queen Victoria leadership in the United Kingdom, they find uh, themselves out that there was a slavery going on in Africa, and the African will be wiped out when Africa used to be described as a darkness continent. And uh, they were kind of shocking. And most of the explorers, European, that went from the United Kingdom, when they, they were forced to take a slave with them, because if they don't do so, their life was in danger too. They have to at least to take a slave with them to Europe. That's how the Atlantic uh, Ocean slave trade uh, started, because some of European actually have been forced to take a slave, because back then they need money. Uh, so, and most of the African, they were used as domestic slavery in Africa, from 9th century all the way to 14th century. And yeah. this before East Africa and whether the region called Sudan today, back then used to be called Nubian or you call it Ethiopia, you call it Kush. 
even the Uganda uh, territory had been going on in Egypt. Egypt actually been benefiting from slavery uh, because they use out the income for them because the slave was uh, investment for them basically and to Arabian is particularly in the North Africa. Uh, so the European also they have been a victim but in many ways in many cases in, when it comes to Africa we actually did not have, we were not able to address the issue of the Islamic slavery, uh, slave, slave trades, uh, because most yeah. of the African leaders felt uh, the history of Islam, they, they felt the history of the Ar Arabians and the focus on Europeans uh, that uh, the African was taking to, uh, to Europe. Uh, yes, uh, this is the culture of those Muslim faith. It's still going on, and it never stopped. So, uh, and that's why I'm here today. I didn't come to America because I know America. I didn't come to America because I had money. I did not come to America because I have uncle or cousin. I come to America because I was seeking for protection because I was not protected in my own country, in my own land. So uh, now I'm here uh, to become the boys of the my African slave women and children. And they still... Uh, today, the story never been told until this day. How many? Do you have any idea? Any statistics on how many African slaves are in bondage and captivity now today in Africa? How many slaves are there right now? You know, uh, I'll, according to in my own situation in Sudan, according to Christian International Solidarity, who mostly released some slaves in 2000 and go back 2001, 2005, there were actually more than 35,000 young men and women still in the captivity in Sudan. That alone in Sudan. Amazing. You talk about, yes. So that is the number, according to Christian Solidarity International. It was actually involving to actually convene the slave master to release the slave and to go home to their own uh, motherland in South Sudan when South Sudan got independent. Uh, the Christian Solidarity International was kicked out from the United Nations because for advocating for African slaves because the United Nations, uh, most of the majority of the Arab nation was they feel embarrassed uh, because this organization was actually telling the truth and we would kick out from the United Nations uh, very much membership where we used to come and uh, educate the United Nations Security Council about the slave in Sudan. So he got kicked out. So that the numbers in Sudan, but when it comes to Africa, it could be large. It could go to a, a thousand and even to a million because most of the African, have, they are in bandage right now in Libya. And they are away to Europe, they are away to Italy, they are away to Germany. A lot of them, they, they've been enslaved and in, in, in domestic slave and in, in, in they use and they sell them in the market. And one African man and woman, they call, I mean, cause about 400 US dollar or maybe 600 US dollar. It depends who you, 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 you bought in that market or you buy in that market. So these are the issues that are going on right now. And the African are not talking about this. The black lab matter do not even bother to talk about this. These are issues that I want the black matter, black lab matter to focus on. If they really, they really care about the black people, or they care about black people uh, lab matter, and I think that those people African in the in the in the market, I think that lab matter as well as those sure. American that lab matter. But I don't think that there's any involvement by these uh, activists in any time soon. And also my own. Uh, my own observation based on what is going on in America, I believe uh, uh, Black Lives Matter does not represent the African-American concern. It, it, it represents the interests of those who want to destroy America. They're not, they are not focusing for the real issue. Uh, they have their own agenda, and that's why mostly people are watching Black Lives Matter very carefully because it doesn't represent uh, the interests of the young men that killed in Minnesota or anywhere, because now it turned to another uh, issue. Uh, it, uh, some individuals, some Islamists, who maybe could be ISIS, are involved, because a lot of them, they felt like this is the chance for them to destroy America, uh, yeah. because a lot of them, they have been defeated uh, by uh, uh, budget demonstration, by trauma demonstration. A lot of them, they lost the war in Libya, they lost the war in Iraq, they lost the war. Now a lot of them, they come as immigrants here, they have different intention 
uh, to fight within. That's the issue that now the Black Lives Matter is talk to. Uh, more, if you guys watching very carefully, a lot of them do not represent the African Americans who are victim in many ways, in many cases. The young people are victim in many cases by the police brutality. That is now turned to a different case. And that's what most of us are concerned and watch the uh, Black Lives Matter in different way, uh, different opinions. Hey, Grandmaster Jay is over an organization that he claims has nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. They were in Georgia about two weeks ago, and uh, I believe it was on Independence Day. They're called the NFAC. I can't say the words. <laughs> and um, basically, they're armed black militants. They have weapons. They were parading at Stone Mountain. And, um, you know, with people like that, if they were to travel to South Sudan, to go to Sudan and free uh, black slaves, would they would they be well received in South Sudan? Indeed, indeed, they will be received because they're coming to protect these slaves. Because the reason why most of the Africans become victim victim globally, worldwide, is because of the slavery. And most of the African uh, in Europe and everywhere in the United States. I do, are not aware about the history of the slavery. A lot of them, they just uh, take it from here. They never went back. How did the slavery occur in Africa? How it was uh, organized? Actually, the slave was organized by Muslim uh, faith. It was not by the African Christian, by the way. <laughs> it was by the African Muslim black Arab who actually converted to Islam, who were, uh, was used to kidnap their own Africans and sell them to Amazing. the Arab masters. That had been the case in Sudan, and it's still going on now. Yeah, I well, I want to ask you a question. Since slavery is still going on now in Africa, in the Sudan, where there are tens of thousands of Africans that are today, 2020, in slavery, what do you have to say to Grand Master Jay? Grand Master Jay has said uh, that, uh, you know, he's, they're, they're tired, they're sick and tired of, of oppression, what, what invitation can you offer Grandmaster Jay about going to Sudan and going to Africa to free the black people in slavery today? You know, I would ask him if he's very concerned about the slavery, I think he should contact me and my team so we can go to South Sudan or maybe go to Sudan and have those who slave. So And also we can go to Libya. That's where this problem is. And also they can also learn about the, the history of the slavery in in. in uh, with facts, not just with the uh, assumption, because a lot of the people here in the diaspora, and we call it diaspora actually, uh, people that live in America or maybe in Europe, a lot of these people, they took information based on what they read and what they get online, and what get, but it's not a real facts because they never speak to African have been enslaved. Uh, it's uh, slavery, uh, captivity, maybe an auction. People like me who actually lived People like me, I witness beating and, and put the shame in the hand. I'm not talking about my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather I was a slave. Uh, my uh, uncle, they were kidnapped. I never find them until this day. I'm talking about my own story. If they're really concerned, they should talk to me. That's what I went through and I'm still going through. But by the way, when I came to the United States of America, uh, I didn't know anything. I did not even know how to speak English. I never heard of America, United States of America. What I heard was the USA. As soon as I re uh, reached Egypt, there's something called USA. That's all that I know. I, uh, three letters. I don't know what it means, what it stands for. I did not know anything. But thank God now that my eyes are open. I know better now. I learn, not only I learn English, I was actually learning Arabic at the time I was in captivity. I, I know how to speak Arabic really well. I can compare the culture. Uh, between the European culture, maybe the American culture, and other uh, race culture. And I can right. actually distinguish what bad and what good. And I think that uh, uh, whoever that man, the person you mentioned, if he's really concerned about... His name, yeah, excuse me, he, uh, go by. His name is Grand Master J of the NFAC. Okay. And uh, so what website should Grand Master J and his followers go to to help free slaves today in Africa? You know, Grandmaster Jay should actually uh, help us to go and uh, liberate our, our young men and women in the slave market. That's something I can send to him. That the message I actually appeal to him to help me and contact my teams. 
and we can actually uh, have them to go, how we can go and live with these people. It's www.cushdemocraticmajority.org. Uh, that is my message to him. And I also to learn the facts about what's going on in Africa uh, and why it's still going on until this day, why nothing has been done by the African leaders, why African leaders are so silent, why the Africans are now African after the colonial, they, they described it now, they have independent states. Why the head of the African Union are not addressing this issue? Why they're compromising the human right of these slave uh, African women and children? Why they compromise their human rights with the, uh, these individuals who come to attack them in their land? And they invade them. They take the land, they take the cattle, they take the animals, they take the cow, they burn down the House to uh, houses to issue to issues. So why are not doing anything about it? And I think that we have a lot to discuss, and I will look forward. Absolutely. To and uh, we wish Godspeed to you in your political efforts to become president of South Sudan. And we hope we can have you on Quorum Radio again.